So our final speaker in this panel is going to address the role of the Catholic Church, the Catholic hier hierarchy, which was obviously pivotal, uh, and I suppose it shows how, how, how quickly things were moving, that on the very day they met uh, here in the, in the conference in the Mansion House, they, they were then uh, dispatched to, to Minute where the bishops uh, were meeting, and then the, the trade union element uh, also had meetings and uh, actions very, very shortly after that, so it was all in, in the space of a very, uh, very, very short time. So, um, Dr. Hanley is one of our uh, brightest uh, and best historians. He's currently in uh, Edinburgh at University, so we're glad to have him here back in Dublin today. So, would you please welcome Brian Hanley? Uh, thanks very much. Good morning. I thank the Lord Mayor for the opportunity to speak here this morning in this historic uh, location because almost a hundred years ago another Lord Mayor, Lawrence O'Neill, addressed delegates from the Irish Trade Union and Labour Party here at the Mansion House and told them to cheers that Ireland today stands united. Her priests are with her people and her people are with her priests. And the key role that the Catholic Church played in the fight against conscription cannot be understood really without reference to the makeup of Irish society in 1918. Very crudely, Ireland was a sectarian society in which wealth and privilege were still very much tied up with religion. Power to a great extent still remained in the hands of Protestant Unionists in that era. One of the driving forces behind popular support for home rule, for example, had been be the belief that self-government would begin to change that. At the same time, however, since the famine, a seismic shift had taken place in Irish society, whereby Catholic large farmers, shopkeepers and merchants had slowly replaced the mainly Protestant landlord class as the most influential group in society. And they were confident in the early 1900s that their time was coming. And the Catholic Church, linked to this group by class and family connection, was an important part of that strata. An establishment in waiting in many ways, but not yet the establishment. And therefore that meant that Ireland politically was unlike much of Western Europe in this regard, particularly in regard to popular perceptions of the Catholic Church and their place in society. In contemporary France, it was said that the village school teacher and the parish priest faced each other across a deep ideological divide. In Ireland, the village teacher and priest could easily have been related to each other and generally often shared the same politics. The hostility with which much of the hierarchy had met the Fenians in the 1860s was not largely replicated in attitudes towards separatists after 1914, and nor was the anti-clericalism of the Fenians replicated among the revolutionaries of that era either. Though the hierarchy was divided politically, an opinion among Ireland's 3,800 priests equally diverse. Some bishops were very loyal to various factions of the Home Rule movement, a few were strongly opposed to separatism, but the bishops and the clergy in general shared the frustrations of ordinary nationalists with the slow progress of Home Rule. They shared nationalist anger over the Unionist revolt against Home Rule from 1912 and the British government's failure to deal with that, and they also shared the uh, general nationalist ambival um, ambivalence towards the war effort after 1914. By 1917, the hierarchy were particularly exercised by the threat of partition. At the top of the church, Cardinal Michael Logue was a conservative in many ways. He believed that outside of the United States, Republican forms of governments were corrupt and despotic, and he thought an Irish Republic was a dream which no man in his sober senses can hope to see realised. Indeed, in 1917, the bishop's pastoral had dismissed what they called utopian agitation in favour of an appeal to the peace conference and the establishment of an Irish Republic as unrealistic. But though cautiously taking their cue from John Redmond's party and supporting voluntary recruitment to the British Army after September 1914, it could not be said that the church as a body had ever enthusiastically supported the war effort. And they were opposed from the beginning, like all nationalist opinion, to any form of conscription. As the war went on, more radical clergymen, such as Bishops Edward O'Dwyer of Limerick and Michael Fogarty of Killaloo, were openly critical of any recruitment. O'Dwyer asked in November 1915, after the arrest of Irish immigrants in Liverpool, that their crime is that they are not ready to die for England. Why should they? What, what have they or their forebearers ever got from England that they should die for her? O'Dwyer's statement was then republished as a pamphlet by separatists. 
Meanwhile, Bishop Fogarty reacted to Edward Carson's inclusion in the British Cabinet by stating that Home Rule is dead and buried and Ireland is without a national party or a national press. The Home Rule Party is but an imperial instrument. At local level by 1916, priests increasingly appeared on anti-war platforms and also at Irish volunteer rallies. Though the Easter Rising didn't meet the Catholic theological criteria for, criteria for a just war, only a handful of bishops condemned it. 22 out of the 31 Catholic bishops and auxiliaries said nothing about it publicly at all. Bishop Dennis Kelly of Ross denounced the Rising as senseless, meaningless debauchery of blood, but he's notable as a relatively isolated voice. Bishop Fogarty had been informed by the rebels in Galway of their plans on the eve of the Rising, and several clergymen actually took an active part there. Though Cardinal Logue recorded his relief that the insurrection was terminated, he thought the British response foolish and pernicious. And during 1917, there were signs by moves by individual bishops, particularly the Bishop of Dublin, uh, Dr. Walsh, and more particularly clergy at a local level towards the growing Sinn Féin party. In East Clare, 12 of 20 new Sinn Féin common were chaired by priests. There was a significant presence of clergy at the funeral of Thomas Ashe in Dublin. A snapshot of local opinion can be glimpsed from the address of Canon Fallon, parish priest of Mount Bellew, to a home rule meeting in November 1917, where he said, if we had an Irish Republic solidly and securely established tomorrow, I do not believe that the Catholic Church or the Irish priesthood would in any way suffer. I believe that the religious instincts of the Irish people would be the same in the future as in the past, and the Catholic Church or its priesthood would have nothing to fear from an Irish Republic. Nevertheless, several bishops and older clergy in particular remain suspicious of the Irish Republican Brotherhood and particularly worried about another rising or more violence. But in April 1918, the entire hierarchy reacted with anger to the announcement of conscription. On the 10th of April, a statement from Minute described it as a fatal mistake, surpassing the worst blunders of the past four years. They felt bound to warn the British government against entering upon a, a policy so disastrous to the public interest and to all order, public and private. And they prophesied that, of course, violence would follow if conscription was introduced. Dr. Gilmartin of Clonfert warned that if conscription came, our fields would be left without workers, our girls would be left without husbands, our colleges would be left without students. On the 13th of April, the Reverend Joseph Brady, the administrator of Armagh Cathedral, announced that following the eminent example set a few years ago by Sir Edward Carson, the priests and people of this cathedral parish of Armagh will hold a series of meetings on next Sunday for the purpose of founding a solemn league and covenant against conscription. Brady stressed that he believed the constitutional weapon of passive resistance was quite sufficient in this campaign and that that had the highest theological authority. Similarly, Cardinal Logue's message against conscription also urged, urged passive resistance in every shape or form. But of course, on the 18th of April, as delegates met here, the bishops also met in the news. Partly they were discussing the fear that clerical students would actually be liable for conscription as well. The conference received a delegation from the Mansion House. De Valera, John Dillon, of course, and others travelled there. De Valera significantly informed the clergy that there could be no limits imposed on the tactics that the Irish volunteers would employ in resisting conscription, and that passive resistance on its own would not be sufficient. De Valera held to this line that the bishops could not dictate what the rest of the movement would do. There were a variety of views within the clergy on this. Cardinal Logue apparently told De Valera that, he, that passive resistance did not mean that you should lie down and let people walk on you. The bishops accepted the wording, however, of an anti-conscription pledge, which <coughs> described conscription imposed upon Ireland as an oppressive and inhuman law, which the Irish people have a right to resist by every means that are consonant with the law of God. Masses of interception were to be said throughout the country to avert the scourge of conscription, and at each of those masses, an anti-conscription pledge would be available for signing. Those signing would be asked to pledge themselves most solemnly to one another to resist conscription by the most effective means at our disposal. Details of local anti-conscription rallies were to be publicised at mass and collections to finance the campaign would be taken at the church gates. These collections were for the purpose of supplying the means to resist the imposition of compulsory military service. So the following Sunday, the 21st of April, these masses took place throughout Ireland and of course they contributed greatly to popular mobilisation as the anti-conscription message and the anti-conscription pledge was unveiled to hundreds of thousands of ordinary Catholics. 
The wording of the Bishop's statement and its pledge are obviously significant and were open to interpretation. It did not condemn conscription per se, it condemned conscription imposed on Ireland because the Catholic Church in Britain, France and the United States had not opposed conscription there. The issue was more problematic for Catholics in Australia and Quebec, as we've seen. Neither did the bishops proceed to determine what forms of resistance would be consonant with the law of God. That was open to interpretation. And at local level, there were some very flexible interpretations. In Virginia County Cavan, Father Gaffney, the parish priest, stated that if men in uniform enforced conscription, it was justified to shoot them. In Letterkenny, another parish priest, Dr. McGinley, urged passive resistance only when every revolver was empty. Now, of course, these may be a minority because there were certainly many priests who were not in favour of armed violence, but there were some who were prepared to endorse force. The bishop's stance provoked particular anger in Britain. The British press was already hostile to the papacy because of what they saw as the Pope's anti-war views. Now the Irish bishops were portrayed as tools of Rome. And again, we can forget how deep sectarianism ran in British society as well. The Times of London claimed that the bishop's action had shaken, the foundation, shaken to the foundations the whole edifice of religious toleration in these islands. The strongly unionist Irish Times stated, the Roman Catholic Church has associated itself intentionally or in grievous error with the party of revolution to the profound dismay of Roman Catholic England. But the Manchester Guardian more shrewdly perhaps noted that there is every indication that the Catholic Church is acting not as an incendiary but as a restraining force and we trust it will continue on this path. Indeed, during April 1918, the Duke of Athol had travelled to Ireland to meet uh, various <coughs> leaders of opinion, and he met Cardinal Logue, and privately Cardinal Logue told him, and emphasised to him again and again, that he had gone into this business in order to restrain the people from violence. The Church has increased its power with the people by taking the popular side. People in Britain did not see that the Church's action was intended entirely to prevent the outbreak of revolution and restrain violence. But the vast majority of people, certainly the vast majority of Irish Catholics, were unaware of these nuances. What they saw was the Catholic Church opposing conscription on the side of the people, and it seemed to illustrate to them what the Kerryman newspaper described as a parliament of priests and people ultimately defeating this measure. Thank you.